So how are anti-racists responding to the spread of racism both online and offline and using social media to spread anti-racist messaging and build anti-racist movements? Well, one of the prime examples that we can think about and very current in the contemporary era is the Black Lives Matter movement that we've been talking about before. The Black Lives Matter movement was started in response to the shooting dead of Trayvon Martin in 2012, after which his killer, George Zimmerman, a civilian, was acquitted and Trayvon was, as Alicia Garza has put it, posthumously placed on trial for his own murder. Alicia Garza, in an attempt to articulate her pain and frustration with the verdict, posted what she described as a, quote, love letter to black folks on Facebook. She ended the post by writing, black people, I love you, I love us, our lives matter, black lives matter. Garza was joined by two other black women, Patrice Cullors and Opal Tometi, and they together created Black Lives Matter, not only to protest police brutality, but also to give voice to individuals who are traditionally left out of black liberation movements, including black women, as well as queer, transgender, disabled, and undocumented black people. So one of the elements that gets forgotten is that Black Lives Matter is a much more inclusive movement than it's often given credit for. So importantly, the movement began as a hashtag that was used on Facebook and later spread through Twitter. Research carried out by Jonathan Cox reveals the importance of social media for spreading knowledge about the movement. And Ince and colleagues show that social media is also a form forum where the so-called average citizen can directly interact with the movement. In some cases, the interaction can be simple. So, for example, a Twitter or a Facebook user can share content that's generated by a social movement, such as, you know, for example, sharing something from the Black Lives Matter Facebook page. But social media also permits individuals to have more complex interactions with the movement. They may talk with each other about what the movement is doing. They may contact movement leaders who often have a very uh, important social media presence. They can debate whether the movement is legitimate um, and otherwise contribute to the overall discourse around a movement. In other words, the online existence of a social movement like Black Lives Matter makes discussion that includes a wide range of people, so not only people who can come to meetings and protest, um, included in shaping the orientation of a particular anti-racist movement. So the spread of awareness of police shootings uh, of black people using the Black Lives Matter hashtag facilitated the move from social media to the streets. And you can see this in the picture, um, you know, being displayed here. Uh, it's the truth is that we are only one bullet away from being a hashtag. The hashtag here was used to mobilize and create momentum for real life protests, such as those that took place in Ferguson, Missouri, after the shooting of Mike Brown in 2014. Black Lives Matter has also traveled beyond the US and has spurred, for example, the birth of Black Lives Matter UK. And also you can see the use of the hashtag in relation to issues of concern to Aboriginal people, uh, in particular around issues of police violence and incarceration. And it was interesting that Dylan Voller, whose case famously came to light in the Four Corners doc documentary about the time when he was in, uh, incarcerated in juvenile detention, uh, the juvenile detention center Dondale and his horrific treatment at the hands of guards there has now become sort of a very prominent activist around issues of uh, police brutality and Aboriginal incarceration. And here you can see him just the other day being arrested at a protest, I think it was in Alice Springs, wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. And importantly, you can see that the E on the t-shirt um, replicates an Aboriginal flag. So you can kind of see a repurposing of a movement that begins in the US but really takes on a global significance being repurposed or refashioned to fit with, um, fit with the needs of Aboriginal activists and their supporters here in Australia. Another area of interest to anti-racist activists is the development of mobile app technology and in particular the use of mobile phone cameras, which has made it easier to spread knowledge about racist abuse and harassment online. 
There have been several high-profile cases that have involved racist abuse against people on public transport in Australia. Uh, the picture here is an example of one particular uh, incident in Melbourne where a woman started abusing a man of colour uh, on a train and then it was filmed and, and put online uh, for all to see. The ability for people to film the abuse and spread it online has in fact led to convictions and has also spurred spot solidarity campaigns uh, such as some of you may have heard of the hashtag I'll ride with you uh, that began after the Lind Cafe siege the idea that people were expressing their solidarity with Muslim women who were coming under attack uh, because they were visible in public settings and were being associated with the actions of um, the perpetrator of the Lind Cafe attack. Another case that received a lot of attention was the Facebook live streaming of the police shooting of Philando Castile by his girlfriend in Minnesota, which inspired this painting by Henry Taylor. So the point is that you know, these these tragic events are being sort of broadcast for all to see. So it's kind of led to the situation of heightened visibility of police brutality and of its racialized nature. Now, specific mobile apps have been developed also in order to track brutality. Examples are uh, the Stop and Frisk app that was developed by the American Council for Civil Liberties. Uh, another one is Copwatch, and there's another one called Cop Block. And there have been other initiatives, including um, a website called iStreetWatch that was set up to record incidences of racist attacks that were happening in the wake of the Brexit referendum in the UK. One interesting example is an app called Vigilante that was actually removed from the Apple iTunes store for failing to meet community standards. Here's um, the trailer that was produced uh, to accompany the app. <laughs> Woman reports she's being pursued by a suspicious man in a black hoodie. She is under the BCUE moving south to the So while the app clearly shows black people as both the victims of crime and the so-called vigilante respondents to crime, it's obviously also clearly open to violation by users. And while police are clearly opposed to racialized people taking the initiative, it is also worth reflecting on the double standards considering support for the self-appointed border patrollers such as the Minutemen. So you know, the jury is out on whether we support people taking vigilante um, vigilante action, but definitely there are concerns around the ability for this type of technology to be abused, which is the primary reason that it was taken off, um, off the iTunes store. But at the same time, you have the existence of other apps that can be used uh, for, you know, basically racial or racist purposes. One example is the Ghetto Tracker app that allows people to use their mobile phone to... Um, to get to know whether they're in an area that they would consider to be um, unsafe or insecure. And these are often um, areas in the United States with high African-American populations, which are then, you know, dubbed ghettos and pe people using this app are use, use it in order to, to avoid ending up in those areas. So myself and my colleague Justine Humphrey um, have carried out some research into five anti-racism apps in Australia, the UK and France and it's the backdrop to a larger study that we want to carry out on digital anti-racism in a transnational context. The main conclusion that we reach from our initial findings is that while these apps, these five apps that we looked at, differ in their function, their political alignment and their interpretation of race, so what each of these organizations driving these apps thought that race and racism were about, 
Um, they were quite different among themselves, but the overriding factor that united each of these apps was that they focused on racism, uh, sorry, on anti-racism as an individualized kind of response. So what can you as an individual using this app do to confront racism that you might encounter? So obviously, if you think about it, the very format of the mobile phone app is something that is configured as personal. So, for example, uh, researchers Kumiski and Hjort talk about the intimacy that you have with your mobile phone. We have developed this kind of intimate relationship with it, and there's this notion of the phone in your pocket or in your handbag being almost an extension of yourself. But how this individual approach impacts on users' perception of whether or not they could actually alter the outcome of a racist situation is dependent on a range of other factors that go beyond the mobile technology experience um, and in particular whether you yourself as a user of this app is somebody who has an experience of racism or knows what racism is. In other words, the way in which you think about whether a mobile app is useful for challenging racism depends entirely on your own experience of racism both in the so-called analog world and in the digital world which as I've said before are increasingly embedded in each other. We found that there was a very strong relationship between who the instigators of the app were, their own perception of what it was useful for, and the extent to which there was an actual uptake among users. So, for example, there's a big difference between community-based apps, such as the Islamophobia Watch app, and different types of apps that were developed in a more top-down sense by organizations such as the Everyday Racism app, which encourages bystanders, who are not necessarily the targets of racism, to take action against incidents of racism, such as the kinds of incidents that we've seen on public transport and so on. If you're interested in research um, on this, you can follow the link in the notes connected to these slides, which you can find on Views, to an article that we published, a short article that we published on the conversation. So to conclude, uh, this lecture has dealt with the meaning of race itself and how it's being transformed in and through digital to communications and technology. So race itself is something that lends itself quite easily to being digitized because it relies on images and codes. So we can think about racial bias being coded in to the algorithms that drive the internet. So algorithms themselves are not race neutral. They carry racial bias within them. They learn how users use the internet and they reproduce that. So the internet itself is structurally racist. It reproduces the type of racism we see in society. So far from being a digital utopia in which differences of race and sex and so on are erased and more equality comes about, which was the hope for the internet when it first began, the internet is in fact a space for a huge amount of racial language and, and racism. This can be seen in the fact that the extreme right increasingly uses the internet to mobilize, is in fact more successful in mobilizing using the internet, arguably, than anti-racists are. But also, the internet, social media, and digital technology are becoming powerful anti-racist tools, and these new initiatives, such as anti-racism apps, are interesting to observe if we want to understand further how we can harness the power of social media and digital technology in order to challenge racism.